What is up? Good morning. It's Thursday, April 19th, which is my mom's birthday. So mom, if you're watching this, happy birthday. Uh, I figured today would be a perfect day to kind of go through the overview of the aquaponics system here in the backyard, take you through the flow of things, see how it's all working, give you a basic overview. All right, so I'm going to get behind the camera. We'll take a look at it. All right, so we will start off with what is the foundation of the aquaponics system, which is the 275 gallon fish tank, which is right there, and eight foot by four foot media based gravel grow bed. So I'd originally built this system for the 2014 Ventura County Fair. I got asked by the head of the ag department to build one, just to kind of educate people on aquaponics and what it is, to kind of get the information out there. So I built this. And after the fair, didn't have anything to do with it, so brought it home, and I figured it'd be perfect opportunity to use it as a learning tool, teaching tool, kind of build a whole system around it, and that's exactly what I did. So, that being said, we can take a look here and go through how the whole thing works. So, that is the 275-gallon fish tank, which also doubles as the sump tank, or the lowest point in the system. And that is where my pump is, which you can't really see it in there. Oh, there it is. So it's a Danner, um, I believe it's a 800 or 1200 gallon per hour pump. One pump, the only pump in the system. And so what that does is it pumps from there, comes out, goes along this back fence right here. So you got that pipe that's down there on the bottom, the one inch pipe, runs along the fence line comes over here and it enters the back of the fish tank right there on so this is 350 gallon large grout fish tank I guess you could call it this is where I keep all my big boys the the adult fish Let's see if we can get a few of them on camera Let me turn the air off. Right, you can kind of see some now. Some of these dudes in here are huge. There's there's like probably about half a dozen four or five pounders. The rest are all about three pounds and up. And there's about 30 tilapia in there. So we got the the males are all blue tilapia, and then I have four Hawaiian gold females in there that I use for a little hybrid when I breed them. So after the water enters the fish tank, the large adult fish tank, it exits via solid lift outlet, which you can see right there, which pulls all the fish effluent off the bottom of the tank. That travels over via gravity and pressure down this pipe. Then it does an upflow through a solids filter right here, which this is going to remove all of the heavy solid fish effluent, all the big particulate that would clog up my media bed due to the high volume of fish that I have in this system. So I use four layers of Matala filter media. The water travels up through that, trapping, like I said, the majority of the particulate. It then exits that outlet right there. There, it goes outside of the tank, travels down this two inch pipe on the fence, and it comes to an intersection here. So, there's three different beds that it's going to. First one we can see is the media bed, which is right here. There's the inlet from the media bed, which is where we have the chard, the kale, and the papaya trees. And then from that T, you can see it also. Oh, well, my camera cooperates here. So after this T, it comes to a valve, a gate valve, which I can regulate the flow with. And that goes into the deep water culture bed, which currently has nothing in it. The seeds are being sowed in that tray over there. Just harvested about two weeks ago. So getting ready to do our spring greens, which is going to be some few different varieties of uh, lettuce and spinach, which I'll do another video on showcasing that. So the water split up to the media bed, the deep water culture bed, 
And the third place it goes is the NFT channel system, which again is regulated right there by the gate valve. And that flows down over to my strawberries, which I have in that channel, in that little shade house. You can go check out. So this one, the NFT section has 26 plant openings or plant growing spaces. It's fully planted out with strawberries right now. It's got a nice crop load on it. It's looking pretty good. Pulling off probably about three to six strawberries per day in here. It's pretty nice. And then so the NFT channel goes down that way. Goes down, flows back towards the fish tank slash sump tank. See, so it goes under. And then we go under here. And that is the drain coming from the NFT channel. And then, I'm sorry, that one is actually coming from the grow bed. This one to the left, you can see it coming from the back right there. That's coming from the NFT channel. And then this one right here it runs along here. That comes in from the deep water culture bed. So they all merge back here underneath the media grow bed. They all drain into the fish tank slash sump tank. So this is the juvenile fish tank. I think I forgot to mention that earlier. This is where I keep all my medium-sized fish. So once they outgrow the breeding tank, I put them in here. And they usually spend a year or two. And then they move up over there to the big daddy tank. So that is it in a nutshell. That is the whole system. It's utilizing the three primary forms of aquaponics or hydroponics, which is media-based, deep water culture flow, and nutrient film technique, or NFT, which is great. It's a perfect tool to, to teach people and to learn from myself. Um, one last thing that I integrated into the system, which is a less commonly used kind of in the aquaponics backyard context, is a decoupled or substrate based or me media based aquaponics. So what I do is I harvest my fish effluent from the solids filter, goes into a remineralization day stock tank, which is my water. I add any missing nutrients that might be in adequate quantities in fish feed for fish growth, but it's slightly deficient for optimal plant growth. So we supplement it via a nutrient dosing system, and then that water goes out to all my plants that I have in substrate containers or in pots, such as all these fruit trees running along the back wall here, and some coffee plants that I got in here. So it's all being irrigated with amended aquaponic system water, which I can go into, I, I do a little more full detailed video on that another day, but just kind of give you a brief idea what that's like. So then we got some solenoid valves down here, and then just a standard uh, hunter irrigation controller right in there. So that's controlling the, the frequency and the duration of all the irrigation sets. It's going out to these plants, just keeping the moisture content in the root zone optimal. That's about it. I'll do another video kind of showcasing the rest of the plants and that that whole offline decoupled substrate approach. So right now, currently in the system, we have one, two, three, four, five Swiss chard plants. Got a couple that are more of the yellow orange stem, some that have the more red stem, and I have some, I believe this one right here, it's kind of the white or light green colored stem. Nice little rainbow variety. And we have some curly leaf kale, which have six plants right here. In the middle there, not doing so hot, which originally thought was a nutrient deficiency, but you have plants right next to it that are looking great, growing much better, much bigger, and they have good coloring. So I don't know if this has something to do with the root zone environment. Maybe it's the proximity to this papaya tree, the root zone has a little anaerobic pocket in the media bed, not sure. Or it's just a, I don't know, a runt of the litter, a little Quasimodo plant just never really developed. Either way, the rest of the plants are doing good. And then we got the two papaya trees, which are looking a little, a little slim right now, not too much foliage on them, but that is because we're just, just getting into springtime here, so it's got done with the winter which in Southern California, it gets a little colder than the papaya trees would like to be. So 
typically drop their leaves with the majority of them. You just keep the ones right in the, the growth point alive. And they're starting to wake up, starting to get some new growth now. So within a month or two, they should be completely loaded, start developing some fruit too. So those guys are about, I want to say like two years old, year and a half, two years old. It's pretty awesome. They're about seven feet tall. They look a lot taller because they're in a grow bed. It's already four feet off the ground. Well, uh, that's about it for the media bed. And then we got the strawberries in here again. They've been throwing out fruit since probably about January. It's now April, so it's got a few months of fruit off of them. Then the deep water culture bed. Nothing at this point in time. Uh, the seeds are going right now. They're already germinating. So probably in about a week or two, we'll get some shoots coming out of there, get some roots going, and then I'll transplant those into here. I like to do, I like to stagger it. So I have 36 plant openings in here. So I'll typically plant, I'll start off with the back row right there. I'll do three in this board, three in this board. So I got six plants, wait a week. Then I'll do the next row of six, wait a week, next one. So it's about a six-week grow-up period, and that way, every week, pulling off six new heads of whatever type of lettuce or greens that I'm growing. So about once every week or so, depending on the time of year, water temperature in the system, um, fish feed, I have to actually physically take this part, clean out all the filter media, which is kind of a big ordeal. But on a daily basis, to prevent me from having to do that more frequently... I have a drain that goes off the bottom, and I just purge off about five gallons off the bottom of the filter, just like this. Kind of see that water, it's pretty nasty coming out of there. That's not too bad today, actually. But I'll take that. So this is the some of the the waste that doesn't go to the offline mineralization tank, which you see right here. So I'll take that and I'll go water some of my soil plants with it. So there's literally zero waste in any of the water, anything that comes out of the system. All right, this giant mess down here underneath the grow bed. It's where everything plugs into. It's where I have my controller for the, the irrigation system for all the substrate and the solenoid valves over there. Weatherproof outdoor box, which you see right there. That's where I keep everything, the GFCI outlet and everything plugged into in the surge protector. That Inkbird heater controller, you can see right there. That controls the heater, which is in this blue sump slash juvenile tank. Right now you can see a thermostat set at 65. It's currently 63.1. It's kind of cold last night. So it's on, it's heating. It'll probably warm it up, get it back up to 65 in a couple hours. Uh, that is the pump, pressure on demand diaphragm pump. Again, that runs, that powers the irrigation from my day stock to the solenoid valves, which goes out to all my plants, which are in pots, which I'll need to do a whole video explaining that one. <laughs> Not enough time. And then we have the all important air pump, which that provides the aeration, keeps, maintains my dissolved oxygen throughout the entire system. So it's going quite a few places. It's coming out of the pump right there. When it's 90, here's the first T. It's going to this little distribution block. But this is regulating the four air stones, which I have in my 275-gallon sump slash juvenile tank. And then that air line travels up. Let me get out from under the system here. Okay, so that goes up. We have the first valve right there, second valve actually, coming off. And that provides... The aeration for the two air stones which are in the deep water culture bed here if you follow that air line down again i have a ball valve right there and this ball valve you can see right there that's controlling all the airflow to my big 350 gallon tank so if i want to do any servicing on it i can shut the air off right there and it cuts air but that goes up and it's got a little distribution block there that's going to three different air stones, which you can see all the aeration that they are creating here. So there's one on the left side, one in the back by the, the water inlet, and there's one on the right side here. Now the water inlet is creating a nice little vortex inside of there. So it's coming in at a 90. 
creating a, a nice uh, counterclockwise spin within the system. Air stones do disrupt that a bit, and you kind of get like some dead spots right here in the front on the surface, but all in all, it works. It works all right. They could benefit from having some baffle plates so it didn't throw off that natural uh, vortex motion, which what that does is it moves all the solids towards the middle, towards the solids lift outlet. So maybe do an upgrade down the road, but for now, it works, works good enough. So one other thing that I have on the on the offline, the decoupled uh, amended aquaponic system water, which is powered by the, that pressure on demand pump, is just a hose here. So I've got some plants and some pots in the yard, such as the little oak tree sapling here. I got some, some flowers, some succulents, I got some passion fruit, which is doing all this whole vine on the, the pergola here. That is not on drip irrigation, so I have to water that manually about once a day. So what this does is it gives me that same amended aquaponic water that I treat, add any deficient, any any missing nutrients to it, um, just with this hose. So the pressure on demand pump works by sensing a drop in pressure, and so then it automatically kicks on and tries to build back up to that pressure. So for this model, it's 45 psi. Um, so it always stays at 45 psi. If it dips below that, which would happen when I do this and I open up a valve, you can see, turn it on, pump automatically turns on, and I cut it off, it builds up pressure, the pump senses that, and then it shuts back off. It's really nice, it's convenient to have when you need to just do kind of some spot, some intermittent watering. Um, it allows you to do that pretty easy. That's pretty cool. This isn't part of the main aquaponic system, but I figured I'd mention it. It's kind of indirectly part of my overall system, the grand scheme of things. It is my breeding tank, which I use to breed my own in-house tilapia. So, sorry for the brood stock back in 2014, and that is the only batch that I've ever bought. The rest of these are all bred in-house here in my garage in this tank. <laughs> it's a 60-gallon aquarium. Got a couple air stones, got a 800 watt heater in there, which is grossly oversized, but just means it's not going to turn on as frequently as it would and run as long if it were a smaller heater. So it works. Got a little bit of cover for the fish right now. Um, typically when, I, when I'm doing breeding, I'll put a spot for the nest and then I'll put some cover for the females. Uh, the male will form a nest and then the females need somewhere to hide when he's chasing them and they're kind of over his nonsense. So for right now, I just got a little two inch and three, four inch cap over there. Just provide a little cover, some housing, some natural, right, completely and absolutely non-natural habitat for these fish, but at least it gives them cover. Um, the Another ink bird, a little heater controller there. So I have a thermo at 77, 76.3. It has a one degree variant. So once it dips below 76, it'll kick on. Um, light cycle, they're on. 12 hour day cycles right now for the lights in the tank and then the whole filtration system is down here it's the fluval 406 filter thing's awesome it's a couple hundred bucks it's a bit pricey but it's totally worth it let's do water changes once a week clean out the filter about once a month and it keeps everything good there's a whole aquarium cleaning kit and some of my nets for the bigger fish and then i got power in the air the Tetra, I think it is, uh, Whisper AP150. It's supposed to be rated for a 150-gallon aquarium. I have it in a 60. Can never have enough air. So that's that. There's the breeding aquarium. These guys, um, they're actually, they've been in there a lot longer than I normally keep them. Uh, that's mainly due to the fact that I don't really have much space out in my main system in the backyard right now. It's pretty full, pretty much at capacity. So I'm going to have to start pulling some of them off. And then I can move these out there. So since these guys, they're about nine months old, I think. Should be a lot bigger than they are, but I've had to greatly reduce the amount of feed that I'm giving them just to slow down the growth, just because I don't want to move them out. I'm not ready to move them out to the backyard yet. So they should be a lot bigger. They should, they should all pretty much be bigger than the one black swan dude that you see in there. Um, he's definitely the biggest. got the most unique color markings. Probably using breeding with him. Pretty cool. Try to replicate those traits. Anyway, this is a breeding aquarium. There it is.